Do you often feel worn out? Are you involved in a job that exhausts you? Many of us simply assume that's just life. Maybe we're too weak. We just can't handle what we see some other people handling. But guess what? There are probably other endeavors, other kinds of work that would actually give you energy. They would actually seem easy and natural. It all depends on certain tendencies in your mind. You don't have less of a brain than other people. Your brain is simply different and unique. And that's how Dr. Arlene Taylor came up with the title of a very popular book, Your Brain Has a Bent, Not a Dent. Let's meet her. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Dr. Taylor, welcome to Australia and welcome to It Is Written. We're delighted to have you on our program today. Tell us about your background. How did you become fascinated with the brain? Well, I can't tell you how I became fascinated with the brain. I can just tell you from my earliest memories, I was interested in it. You know, this three pound universe, you know, researchers say it is the most amazing organ in our entire known universe. It is what makes us who we are. I tell people, learn more about the brain in general and about your brain in particular, and then use it by design to be successful. Because the brain function research is relatively new. I mean, we've only had scans for a couple of decades now, and we're getting better and better and finer equipment to look at that. Before we had scans, we'd observe behaviors and then try to make correlations with what must be going on in the brain to get that behavior. We learned things when Dr. Sperry, for example, did the split brain surgeries for people who had seizures that involved the whole brain and were life-threatening. And then we would sometimes, after a person died, crack open the skull and take the brain out slice it on a meat slicer, literally, and then lay those slices out on a light table and look at them and see what we could learn about anatomy. We learned a lot about the brain, did nothing for the person's brain who was on the light table, and it really didn't teach us much about function. We learned anatomy and structure, but function is what's exciting. Dr. Taylor, in your book, Your Brain Has a Bent, you state that our brains are bent. Can you explain what this means? Yes, each brain has a bent, and each brain on the planet is different. Even the brains of identical twins are not the same. So what is a bent? Well, compare my face to a clock. Put 12 on my forehead, six on my chin, three and nine by my ears. Now, draw a, an imaginary line joining those numbers, and you have, in effect, four cerebral divisions. The brain works together. We use all of the brain all the time. But having said that, each division adds functions, helps us do things that are easier for that part of the brain to do. A bent simply means that, according to work by Dr. Richard Hayer in Southern California with PET scans, positron emission tomography, brain imaging. What happens is that we think every brain is born with an, a slight energy advantage in one of these four chunks over the other three. And if you figure that out and you can align more than half your life with activities that use that part of the brain, you'll use less energy, require less oxygen, less micronutrition. Uh, require less rest periods in between using your brain because your bent gives you an advantage. Can you give us an idea of what each division can actually do? Well, let's talk about the two frontal lobes first. You have a left frontal lobe and a right frontal lobe, and each one, of course, would be behind your eyes. So the left frontal lobe we call the prioritizing division and it contains inductive-deductive reasoning. It allows us to set and achieve goals. 
it does like to delegate. It likes to be in charge and direct things. Now, moving across into the right frontal lobe, because there are bridges that connect these two hemispheres, otherwise your right hand would not know what your left hand was doing. In the right frontal lobe, we call that the envisioning division. That contains a sense of humor, it contains intuition, it contains looking at the big picture, it is a very interesting part of the brain in that it wants to innovate. It doesn't want to do the same thing over and over again. It wants to paint a new picture. It wants to write a new piece of music. It wants to write a new poem. It wants to write a new book. Now, you also have posterior divisions, and that would be behind your cheeks more in your brain. And so you would have the left posterior lobes, uh, three lobes in each one of those divisions. The frontal left and the frontal right are one big lobe each. But these other two parts have three lobes each. And the left posterior is called the maintaining division. And that's the part that helps you do things over and over and over again in the same way. Its three lobes are interesting. On the outside, on each side, you'll have what's called the temporal lobe, and that helps you on the left side with speech. You know, audible speech comes out of Broca's area up in the frontal lobe, but in this lower part of the brain, that's where you can listen to sounds and turn them into something that has meaning. That's where you can read words and read sentences. That's where you can form letters so that we can communicate with each other. On the right posterior lobes, again, three lobes, on the temporal side, it can decode speech a little, but it's much more interested in decoding the melody line of music, for example, or the music of speech. What does the person's voice sound like? You will have the two parietal lobes that help you with muscle movements. You will have the two occipital lobes that help you take in information through your eyes. So if you look at this picture of the brain, you can see one half of it, basically. So here will be that right frontal lobe, the way we're looking at the brain. Here would be the temporal lobe on that side, and the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe and they're marvelous. They do slightly different things on each side. We talk about the right posterior lobes being the harmonizing division. So if you were looking at the right side of the brain, um, this part of the brain is interested in no conflict, thank you very much, wants everybody to get along, cares about how people feel, and so it's it's a pretty important part of the brain for relationships. So having said that, we also have at the very front part of these two frontal lobes, we have something called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex definitely distinguishes human beings from other mammals because it has fine executive functions uh, conscience, morality, willpower, weighing information so that you can try to make the best choice. Dr. Eileen, how do we figure out how our brains are bent? That's an excellent question, because if you figure out your bent, and there are several of them, you have the opportunity or you are at higher risk for actually being more successful in life. When we look at bent, we talk about it in sort of a pyramid fashion. And so the bottom, the foundation of that pyramid is do you have a bent that is primarily systemizing, aligned with a male brain? Or is it primarily empathizing, aligned with a female brain? Or is it called an intersex brain, which is sort of 50-50? So you figure that out. And then the next bent is, were you born and raised in the eastern part of this globe or the western part of this globe? Because researchers in cultural neuroscience are now identifying that your brain can have a slightly different bent depending where you are born and raised. 
And the third level is, are you an extrovert? Are you an ambivert? Or are you an introvert? So Dr. Arlene, should we only do what our brain bent leads us to do? I think we need to use all parts of our brain because there's two more layers on the pyramid of who I am. And the next layer up is sensory preference. And while we may be able to use all the sensory systems, one of them usually registers most quickly and intensely in our brains. And those are a visual preference, an auditory preference, or a kinesthetic preference. And that has everything to do with how we learn most easily. So I have an auditory preference, which means I'm very alert to sounds. I can sit in a lecture and listen carefully and get the information. Part of auditory is also reading and writing. All comes out of the same chunk in the temporal lobe, Wernicke's area. And so for me, reading, listening, taking notes is an easy way to learn. But for someone who is visual, they would much rather see the information somehow. And they may like to use their eyes reading. But for a kinesthetic person who wants to get in there with their hands and actually do it, just listening or just reading or just seeing may not be so helpful. Dr. Arlene, anyone who has ever been in a relationship would know that men and women think differently. Are there differences between male and female brains? Oh, of course there are differences, and we know that at some level. But it's only been recently that we've got really good research about that. We've known, for example, that at birth, the little girl's left hemisphere is more developed and probably will be slightly larger her whole life. In the little male brain, his right hemisphere is more developed at birth and will always be slightly larger during his life. I find this fascinating because the side of the brain that seems to be most developed at birth for little boys is not the side of the brain that is rewarded in our, you know, current cultures. They want little boys to be left-brained and yet their giftedness as little boys is on the right side of the brain. And so sometimes they have a difficult time in school because most education, at least for the first four, five, six years, teaches to the left brain but not to the right brain. And so these little boys can feel stupid. And if they're twins, a boy and a girl, she gets A's and he gets C's and he thinks, there's something wrong with my brain. And there's nothing wrong with his brain. And as soon as the school system starts adding right hemisphere courses, he starts to excel if you've been able to keep him in school that long. Now, you also see introverts and extroverts as part of our brain bent. Well, an introvert likes to observe things. They, they will participate, but uh, not until they've observed for a while and decided if it's something they really want to do. So in a group, when somebody gets a bright idea, oh, let's play a game of whatever, baseball, uh, the introvert may want to sit on the sidelines and observe and cheer, but might not want to participate. And if an extrovert doesn't understand that, they think, what's the matter? This is a wallflower, you know? How come they're not, they don't want to play with us? They don't want to be part of this group. Sure they do, but they want to be part on the observing fringes. And sometimes you'll have an extrovert marry an introvert because opposites attract. And you have to understand that the introvert cannot keep up in activities with the extrovert. And so sometimes the extrovert, let's say it's a woman and she's married to an introverted male who maybe is a great researcher and he's in his office researching a lot of the time, not participating. And maybe he's lecturing because lecturing is easy because it's just one to one, the lecture and the group of people he's lecturing to. And so she can't keep up with him. If she tries to, she'll get sick. And these are the little kids often in school that are pushed to participate and they get sick because when the brain becomes overwhelmed with data and stimulation, one way to be able to stay home and spend the day in bed and take a deep breath is to get sick. 
So little introverts will often get sick uh, more often than extroverts. Is that, is that giving you a picture? Does it make sense? So if she's very extroverted, he's not gonna wanna keep up with her and do all the stuff she wants to do. So she needs to have some really good women friends that she can go do things with. And the reverse is true. If you have an introverted woman partnered with an extroverted male, he needs to have some good buddies. I think you call them mates over here in Australia. He needs some good mates that he can go do things with, ride bikes, play games, and get the stimulation he needs without exhausting her. I found over the years that my children seem to have different learning styles. What is the cause of this? And is there a best way to learn? I think you could answer your own question just based on the discussion we've had. Every brain has a bent, and it's going to be in those five areas at least that we talked about. So every brain has its own learning style. And therein lies the challenge for education, because the brain learns best holistically, if you will, when they get all the pieces together and they can see it together. And much of learning in schools wants to be just sequential. I'll give you a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow and a little bit the next day. That's not how the brain learns best. Give it the whole piece, even though you go back then and do some additional pieces of data. So it's a good thing if what we do matches how we're bent. Oh my goodness, yes. That's how you be really successful in life. If you, can, if you can choose a career, a job, whatever you want to call it, and at least 51% of the tasks, the activities that are required for you to be successful in that career matches your brain's bents, then you are really much more likely to be successful. But what if my job or responsibilities require me to do something that my brain isn't bent to do? That happens for all of us. And that's why we have a whole brain. But if you can get the 51% match, then the 49%, you can sort of sandwich throughout the day. Let's say there's something that's really hard for me. So I'll do something that I love that's easy for maybe an hour. And then I'll do 15 or 20 minutes of a piece that's more difficult because it's going to take more energy. And then I go back and do something that takes less energy so that at the end of the day, you've got all the pieces done. Now, what happens when I experience trauma or a crisis? How does my brain react? And what can I do to help me through this process? That's a fascinating question because nobody gets through life unscathed. Everybody has trauma, death, sadness, disappointment. In a lump, I call that experiencing a loss. And if the loss makes you anxious or fearful or helps you feel unsafe, then here we go. It impacts the brain. Instead of your energy and attention being up here in the cerebral, those four chunks, what happens is that your brain begins to direct its energy and attention down toward the lower parts of the brain because down here, cerebellum brain stem, that's where we have the stress responses. That's where we go when we feel unsafe because the, we want the brain to help us quickly come up with some kind of strategy that will make us feel safe. And we call this process downshifting. It's marvelous that the brain can quickly focus down toward the response, stress part of the brain when we feel stressed, when we experience loss. But if you stay stuck down there, then you don't have ready access to these conscious thought processes up in your cerebrum. And you need to know how to get up. And here is a key brain fact, if you will. In your brain, you cannot simultaneously be involved with fear and gratitude. 
So often when we experience a loss, people become fearful, in addition to being sad because they're fearful some other time I'm gonna have a loss and it doesn't feel good and I don't like it and they start being anxious and worried. And that's the reason I think scripture says really clearly, be anxious for nothing. Because the ideal is to stay up here in the thought process of the brain unless you are actually in danger and then go down and access those stress responses, but otherwise you want to be up where you can cognitively think and plan and remember and decide how you need to deal with this. So since fear and gratitude cannot coexist at the same time in the brain, the minute you start feeling anxious and fearful and anxiety is just a part of fear, you must immediately think of something for which to be thankful. Dr. Taylor, in your book, you mentioned that we should focus on building blocks of Benson Dents. Can you explain what this means? Well, it means that the brain loves variety and it loves to learn. The brain loves to learn. And so there are some things that you can certainly do to help yourself learn. A few key things. If you smoke, stop. If you've never smoked, never start because the brain needs oxygen. And so with every puff of smoke, you're reducing the amount of oxygen that gets to your brain. And so giving your brain lots of oxygen with no cigarette smoke taking up some of the space is good for your brain. Other things it'll be good for in your body too, but it, we're talking about the brain. Exercise, physical exercise is key because although the brain functions like a muscle, meaning you exercise a skill and it gets stronger, just like muscle tissue, but it's not muscle tissue even though it functions like it. So no muscles in the brain. Therefore, the muscle movements of the big muscle uh, regions of the, of the body, like walking, uh, swimming, riding bicycles, a bicycle, uh, is going to accelerate the heart rate. It's going to increase the rate at which blood flows through the brain, bringing oxygen, glucose, micronutrition, and taking away the waste products. So that's huge for brain function. Dr. Arlene, this is important information. Can you run through the summary of how we can care for our brain? No tobacco, I use no alcohol. Physical exercise, challenging mental exercise, help it learn, stay, stay stimulated. Uh, sleep, you need sleep. Make yourself get it and you'll be amazed at how your brain will respond. And then really good balanced nutrition. You know, Mediterranean cuisine is the way that we're leaning toward to have your brain be really healthful. And you know the blue zones in the, in the world, the blue zone people, they live longer than other people and their brain function stays well. And when you look at how they live, you know, they incorporate those, just the basics we've talked about, they incorporate them in their life. Dr. Arlene Taylor, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to have you on our It Is Written program today. And I'd like to wish you all the very best in your endeavors. Appreciated you inviting me, Gary. I love to talk about the brain. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the spirit of Christ offered to all who put their faith in him. Thank you for the potential that you see in us and also the abilities you give. Help us to see them clearly Help us to understand what we can do best and keep us focused on you so your spirit will keep us going in the very best direction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It is written, truly is, television that changes lives. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs>